Okay, let's talk about the topic. Um, so after listening to my little rambly spiel yesterday, at least those who are you who are here, who has any ideas about what ways to approach the topic, whether in the affirmative or the negative, uh, in context of settler colonialism? Yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, as with any other international topic that ever was in the past, you're going to have the sort of imperialism, colonialism links, where people just kind of label every single thing that's wrong that the U.S. has ever done foreignly, which is almost everything, actually. Um, so I, I, it's the reason I find this uh, whole little module seminar thing uh, kind of important for this topic, because I think it's going to be huge night ground. I think it's kind of the core of most negative arguments. You're going to have most hedge good, hedge bad debates. Af, it's pretty easy to go hedge good. You're like, national service is good, you know, military is good, blah, blah, blah. Unless they take a more domestic route with like, Teach for America and AmeriCorps. Sounds good, it's a little bit more muddled. But most apps are taking an international approach to the national service topics, a lot of military apps. And those links are very easy to draw out. So for those of you who had access to the Dropbox, if you go into the file that's uploaded, that's like BBI, LA2, set coal file. Um, why are you loading on me? Uh, wait for my computer to not do this. Yeah, okay, I'm glad, yeah. Don't edit the file, because then that creates duplicate copies. Um, if anything, copy and paste into a new Word document. That way it doesn't mess with uh, verbatim formatting. Uh, anyway, sorry, my computer's bugging out. So, um, if I put two different generic shells in there, the one in C for policy teams, the other one in C for K teams, the distinction to be drawn, uh, a one in C for policy teams is people who are going to be defending um, implementable plan text that the United States federal government, the United States is going to do X, like the United States is going to make the draft mandatory for 18 to 24 year olds for the army. That is an example of a usually a policy team. They're going to be more going for policy style impacts as to why hegemony is going to solve for extinction. Hegemony solves for ISIS. Uh, hegemony solves for terror. Soft power good. Hard power good. Those are going to be the policy teams that you're going to be looking at, um, which is where it is a. Hold on, that was BBI. I'm a missing student. Yeah, um, so if you go to the um, first three links, I did put a little section where it's like insert link here, because it has to be a little more topic specific, although with this topic, it's pretty easy to get general links and still have a decent link debate. Ks are usually just kind of like throwing the, you know, like the fishing pole out in the water and like, oh, hopefully I catch something. But I think this topic's pretty easy. Like, especially if the app is straight up being like, we need to put more people in the military. Hedge is good. This is pretty easy debate to have. So even these first three links that I put in there are um, pretty representative of most apps. So the first card is the Morganson 11 evidence, which I think it, it what's up? Um, I only got access to like the foundational texts. I don't think I ever got anything yes. beyond that. So like the email you sent like, here, it was not box. It just like gives me a kiss. Uh, those are the texts. No, uh, like yeah, but like the the shell. Can we just put your files on the box? Because like if I even if I go to like mine, all I have. Alright, um, for now, you just kind of look up, okay. like, like that, we can figure out access thing afterwards. That's probably me being an idiot, not knowing how to work Dropbox, which is probably true. Um, yeah, so, since everyone's going to be looking at the same thing, I shouldn't really hear any typing. I shouldn't hear any typing. Um, the Morganson 11 evidence uh, is actually in one of the foundational texts that was uploaded. The, it's about biopolitics and uh, settler colonialism. Uh, this piece of evidence, I tagged it as to where the affirmative, is <laughs> the affirmative starting point 
it already ignores the history of settler colonialism, which is something we can't ignore because we exist on the very land that was stolen and uh, we kind of kill people over, you know? Uh, if you weren't here yesterday, it's kind of easy to figure out that we didn't live here before. Obviously, no one lived here before that is here now for the most part. It was just a lot of tribes and like native people. What happened to them? They're gone because of us. But now we're here at debate camp. Go us, privilege. Um, but uh, this piece of evidence just kind of outlines the ways and uh, the reason that we're able to sort of look past all that and think about like, oh, like let's put more people in the military and stuff. We are ignoring the violence that occurred on the very land that we're standing on because we deem native life so um, disposable. It means nothing to uh, white society. It has meant nothing for hundreds of years. That's just that kind of first piece of evidence. Uh, the tag outlines different things that happens like broken treaties and stuff. And it's just examples of everything that we ignore in our drive to sort of expand colonial power. Uh, the second piece of evidence that I put in, uh, that I put in there is the Tuck and McKenzie evidence. Um, this uh, talks about the way in which we repl replicate a uh, powerful state discourse. See, the very uh, fact that we're like, hedge is good, state is good, the state will always be good, the state is good in context of, uh, I guess it's not really going to be a thing on this topic, but like in context of natives' AFs. Um, even saying, the, even if it's like a soft glove to and it's like, the United States is going to do this for natives. Uh, that very mindset is bad because where in history has the state, uh, specifically our state, done something good for native people? You can't really name anything. That's always a fun CX question. First, uh, if it's like a hard policy app, or even a, especially soft left staff. Like if you're having a sort of like a K app that's not non-topical or performance based, uh, it's just kind of like, oh, the United States can do this and it's going to solve back for like years of repression. You're like, okay, first question CX. When has the state has when has the state ever done anything good for Native people? And you watch them stumble because it's like, really never. That's the fun part about this debate. You can't really give an example. Uh, when it comes to Afro-past debates, people try to be like, oh, well, slavery's over, like, we had a black president, which is all pretty false. But it's funny to watch them stumble. It's kind of fun. Um, the third link, um, ah, stop loading, is the Cloen Valdez, Cho and, uh, Cho and Valdez Lovin uh, link. It talks about reformism specifically, so when the law tries to kind of backtrack and be like, oh, we might have done something in the past, but let's fix it now. Um, it's sort of the mindset of, um, oh my god, I'm blanking. Oh. <laughs> I'm so upset. Uh, American exceptionalism, which we always think the state is going to be good this time. The state is going to do something better this time. When in actuality it isn't. Every time that the state has done something bad, it's because, oh, we're going to do something good now. Even if we have done something bad in the past, we're going to do it good now. So like, um, making slavery illegal. Um, 13th Amendment. The state was like, slavery is bad, let's fix it now, but slavery is still legal under the 13th Amendment because it legalized prisons and prison labor. Things like that. Um, uh, reservation policies, when it was like, the state was like, oh, we killed a bunch of you and we took your land, but here's somewhere to live. But we still have biopolitical control over your life. We still have control over every aspect of your life, where you live, how you eat, and we're going to kill you by dumping nuclear waste on your land. Like, those type of things. Uh, the state can never reform itself. The, um, if you're going to be going for set coal, it's always going to be a very radical leftist approach to the topic in which you are always going to try to function outside of the state because most all the links, most all the literature is very much the state's bad. The structures are bad. The colonial structures are bad. And the only way to escape it is radical rejection and refusal. Uh, then it's like, insert specific links here. And Insert specific link to that here. These are also kind of long because these are policy um, timed negs. So there is a lot of highlighting to do. And probably you don't need five different links. Uh, also because a lot of these links also have impacts implicitly built within them. Um, so if you are going to use this file, you really have to go through time to your own change tags. Um, you should change the tags every time you look at cards from back files. Go through it, highlight it yourself, and you tag it yourself. Because that means you have the understanding of what it's saying. Also, these tags are really long, because I like long tags. That's an issue. It's time. You have seven minutes. You don't have that much. Um, the Bird 11, um, I just kind of like putting it. If you want to think this on a very general basis, a lot of these are really the same argument, just nuanced in different ways. 
Bird 11, once again, is just kind of like U.S. hegemony ignores the violence that's happened in the past, which is very similar to the first piece of that. First, first piece of evidence, which is the Morgan Send 11 evidence. There's nuances here and there that you could really kind of like, I don't know, bring out in the debate, depending on the debate that you're having. But for more general debates, you don't need all these pieces of evidence. If you have two good link cards that stand true, then you're good with that. You don't need to be reading five different ones. Then you go on to the um, Santos 3 evidence, which is uh, sort of the impact card if you want to label this uh, critique traditionally. It's just like, the logic of settler colonialism is what caused things like the Holocaust and war and the drive to kill people. Pretty self-explanatory. Because of our little drive for land, we're going to kill people It's there. Because I'm like, I want your land, bro. Like, you could farm real good. Um, then the uh, alternative is probably the most, what I actually think is the most important part of the critique. Because um, if you don't have an alternative, why are we going to vote next? You know, you have to be able to show and crystallize to the judge and the opponent why the world of the alternative is better and what the world of the alternative looks like. So the specific one that I personally like to use that I've attached to, I'm pretty sure both of these, um, is the Grande of Four evidence, which comes from Right Pedagogy by Sandy Grande in 2004, where um, she specifically talks about the ways uh, that our educational system and the way that we learn and what we learn has been infiltrated um, and colonized by settler colonialism. Uh, she draws a specific example of when white people went into reservation land, took children, and forced them to go to white schools in order to educate and civilize them. That infiltration of education and that annihilation of um, indigenous practices uh, is a very type of genocide that we're criticizing. So um, she brings up the concept of red pedagogy, uh, which we kind of went over yesterday. For those of you who weren't here, it's just looking at, um, at like analyzing and deconstructing structures through the lens of um, indigeneity, through the lens of nativism. So in context of the uh, topic and in terms of the affirmative, you're looking at the affirmative and understanding and criticizing the structures that has built the affirmative and that the affirmative exists within and perpetuates. You doing that is a form of red pedagogy because you're analyzing the uh, affirmative through the lens of indigeneity. So, uh, Sandy Grande advocates that we look at the whole world like that. It is a form of decolonization of our minds, which many all, um, um, I guess, authors of uh, people who study uh, set coal literature uh, advocate that we do, because how can we decolonize the physical world if we cannot decolonize ourselves? Um, decolonize yourself just means an inner analyzation of the colonial mindset that we all have, because we're all, what are we all? We're all the settlers. We all profit of stolen land. For those of you who aren't here, probably one of the most important things you can remember that we're all the settlers. You never want to be like, I am not the settler. Because you are. Like, look, we're at UCLA. Uh, I think yesterday I named like five different tribes that were exterminated to build this university. <laughs> um, so that's the one and see for policy teams. One and two for teams, uh, policy teams, uh, I find it probably an easier debate to have because it's more traditional. It's more hedge good, hedge bad, stay good, stay bad. Like it's a very generic debate to be having. Um, the more fun part, which I enjoy, is uh, going against K teams when you're just taking a more left approach. So earlier when I talked about soft left Fs, uh, does everyone know what that means? Like a soft being soft left. You're kind of being K, but you're like, let's use the state. Always take the hard left approach. So Tuck and Yang. Um, 12. Everyone's heard, has anyone heard of the name Tuck and Yang? Okay, so there's this really bad piece of evidence that floats around in LD for some reason uh, that's like, you commodify pain and suffering, and that's bad. Like, that makes no sense. That's a total misreading of Tuck and Yang. Tuck and Yang are actually um, uh, authors that are lined in the section of literature of settler colonialism. I don't know where that argument came out of. It's like one of the multiple bad things that floats around in this debate world. Um, that has nothing to do with what they actually say. Um, Tuck and Yang, uh, in this piece of evidence, I like this piece of evidence for ass or negs because it outlines what settler colonialism is. Uh, colonialism is. The tag um, is how I explained settler colonialism yesterday. Settler colonial colonialism is the impetus and structure that allows other forms of violence to exist. It projects racism, sexism, homophobia. It didn't create them, it projects them. It's like through a little microphone, the example I gave yesterday. Um, this uh, card kind of works as um, an impact card, really. 
Um, it kind of outlines all the bad that it does, but it also tells you what set cold is, which I think is pretty important for the debate, because if you and the judge and the opponent understand what set cold is, then it's easy to draw links from it. Uh, the one and C for Kane teams is kind of short because a lot of that debate is not going to be generic. It's going to be pretty um, specific to the affirmative. Uh, the example I'm going to keep on going to is a nuclear power topic because nativism was very core to that topic literature. Um, a lot of uh, teams were like, the United States is going to stop dumping and stuff. Like, that's not enough. You go back to the example of, like, when has the state ever done anything good? Can't really say anything. Like, can anyone tell me what the state has done that has benefited native populations? Yeah. There's really nothing. Um, a lot of people try to say, like, reservations, but, like, reservations are pretty bad. Um, the only reason they're there in the first place is because of colonialism. Like, there's really nothing good that has happened. Um, Another argument that I have to still insert cards in here is sort of like the co-option. Uh, it's a co-option to say that you can even extend. You don't need a piece of evidence with it, um, which is a disadvantage to the permutation because the first thing you always do in counterplan K debates, you make a perm. You always make a perm because the perm is a test of competition. Even if it doesn't make sense to you, make the perm. That's a debate lesson for the day. <laughs> um, uh, there's always going to be a permutation, so it's very important to extrapolate a disadvantage to the perm, especially in this debate, because um, the it's going to be a soft lift after They're going to be like, the U.S. Um, does this for natives, and you're going to be like, no, the U.S. sucks. We need to reject and refuse, and we need to fight back because the state sucks. Um, and they're going to be like, perm, we could fight back, but still work within the state, which already kind of doesn't make sense. But they're going to make a perm anyway. Um, and that's what you make a co-option to decide. You give an example. Uh, there is like a 19-day standing on, um, what's that island that's a prison that's here in California? I forget uh, the name. Alcatraz. Yeah, there's a standing on Alcatraz um, for like 19 days by indigenous people. That's like, give us our land back. Like, give us our rights. We want to live like we used to live, free from sort of state control. Um, and at some point, they came to an agreement with... Um, like the police and stuff, and like, oh, well, let's kind of talk about this. And that's gone. Disappeared. Didn't happen. The American Indian movement, um, not as prevalent as it was today, except for DAPL that happened not too long ago. It kind of did rise back a little. Um, but even then, the movement kind of fell apart because of state co-option. Uh, I like, uh, in these debates, you kind of have to look, the state as an, uh, look at the state as an entity, almost as a person that makes conscious decisions because it does w exist within structures that implicitly and explicitly aim to sort of eliminate indigenous populations. Um, so you have to look at it as an entity that lives and breathes and thinks. Uh, it sounds kind of weird, but it makes more sense to think about it that way. So the state is simply trying to assuage people's voices just to not listen to them, but not actually please them. Um, you can look towards like the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a lot of protests and fighting and like radical um, turns against the state and stuff. But in a lot of instances, if you ever come to an agreement, you, that movement kind of dies away. Nothing ever actually happens. So like, I always like to use a civil rights movement as an example. Um, civil rights movement was really huge, big point in history, something you should understand if you're gonna read critical literature. Um, I think like kind of a good thing, you know, people are fighting back, people are trying to fight for what they believe in. Uh, Civil Rights Act passed, kind of dies down. Where are we now? We're stuck with neo-slavery and new germ cone laws. Uh, the poverty cycle, cycling uh, black populations back into prison, uh, slavery within prison. Prisons are allowed to work people without paying them, kind of thing like that. Uh, it's just an example of how um, you say it just assuages the population and kind of a lot of the time makes things a lot worse than they originally were. So um, here, I put in a lot of specific links, if you go on the file, like a lot. They're kind of generic, and they're mostly applicable to K apps, I mean to policy apps, because once again, you have to put more specific K things. Um, a lot of generic impacts. The cool thing about a lot of the links, they include impacts within them. And then the alternative debate. Here, um, I put a lot of different alternatives. Uh, they're kind of for you to dabble and explore with. Uh, the alternative really is based upon, one, what the app reads, and two, what the links and impacts are. Um, so you're not going to be reading the same, I mean, 
for the most part, we kind of are. I uh, read the same alternative all year. Um, I would use the grande evidence, the one about red pedagogy, more for the AF uh, framing as a way we should look at the resolution. Um, and then on the negative side, I would kind of use more. Uh, does anyone know what, who Ward Churchill is? Just another author. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether he's credible or not. Um, I forget why. Um, oh, because he plagiarized himself when writing his later uh, works. So with his earlier works, yeah, he plagiarized himself, which is why there's debate whether he's credible, um, because a lot of the ideas that he brought up in later works and introduced as new with things that he had already written. Um, one, plagiarizing yourself, I uh, don't think that's too big of an issue. It's not like you're straight up lying about anything. Two, a lot of things that he says are just set him down like things you can't contest. So War Churchill talks a lot about the effects of colonialism, the genocide that occurred because of it, um, and the piece of, I'm pretty sure it's in here, if it's on, I will upload it, um, is a piece of alternative evidence that I read with the negative that said, um, the basis of it was like, the only way we can escape colonialism is by exterminating the settler. This, I took two different routes depending on the debate. I was having who I was debating, because if you just really hate people, you're just really gonna go for it. Um, the softer approach was exterminating the settler was more of a metaphor for decolonizing our minds and decolonizing the debate space. Um, very epistemological approach, changing in which we, how we learn and what we learn. The more radical approach I took was like, let's just kill white people. Um, a lot more radical. Had a lot of those debates though, uh, especially when I debated people I hated. Um, so it's just really how you feel with the position. If you're white, probably not the best approach to take. Um, I don't know. It'll be a little weird for you. Like, let's kill all whites. And you're like, what about you, bro? Like, it doesn't work out. <laughs> um, it certainly just depends on the debate that you're having. So if you're having a very, like, if you're hitting just, like, this super privileged, like, white, straight boy from, like, big name schools that has all the money in the world, just every single bitch tournament every weekend, not gonna say any names, because it can't. Um, and they're just reading a hardcore policy F. They're just straight up, like, Bostrom 12 or whatever, Extinction Matter is blah, 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 kind of thing. That's more when I would go for it. Be like, LOL, die. Um, leave, like, go somewhere else. The, uh, Problem with that one, because of more soft approach, that's a very reasonable debate to have. It's like, oh, epistemology, like how do we learn and stuff. The problem with that one is, I've only ever approached it once. What happens after the settler leaves? The land that, and the land in the world that existed beforehand is gone. It's destroyed, it is no longer there. Even if the settler does leave, the conditions in which they have left the natural world, it's in shambles. There's nothing like what used to be. That's the only issue with that alternative. I doubt most people will point it out, but I don't know with the popularization of the argument, people will begin to figure it out. So ultimately, um, if you do take, if you do look at the um, extermination approach that way, uh, it's kind of like an alt fails because we are not going to know the world outside of the settler, right? It's the only thing that we know. Um, but on the next side of that debate, when people are like, what does the world of the alt look like? To be honest, I'm honest, you can't ever say what the world of the alt looks like because you don't know what it looks like. People don't outline what it's going to look like. There's no blueprint that's like, outside of capitalism, this is what the world looks like. Like, that's not going to happen. It doesn't exist. No one says it because it's not something you can hold true. Um, the best approach to that sort of like alternative debate in general, no matter what K you're debating, um, as long as it advocates for a different world outside of a structure, is I can't tell you what the world looks like, but it's probably better than what we have now. Um, everyone has heard of the term try or die. You really have to take a try or die approach, whether you try for an alternative or you constantly live in the um, world of the app, the die part. So in context of this, it is a try or die for the negative. We have to um, venture into the world of the alternative, even if we don't know what it looks like, because chances are, it is probably better than what we have now. Or you vote AF and we continue to exist in the uh, cyclical cycle, uh, <laughs> cyclical cycle of set coal and the uh, for a sort of implicit, explicit, mental and physical forms of genocide in it, that which it perpetuates kind of thing.
Um, I can't emphasize it enough. The alt debate is the most important debate you're going to have on Ks. Uh, I think that's where a lot of people fail, is that you can't explain the alt, which makes the perm really easy, because as a judge, if I don't know what I'm voting for, why am I going to vote for it? At least the AF is like telling me what's going to happen, kind of thing. Um, yeah, most important part, work on the alt debate. When you're looking at alt, type out the alt. Type out the world that you see. Like, type it out. You should be typing out everything. But if you're going to type out something, type out that. Even if it's like in your prep time or during the other person's speech. Because you want to make this crystal clear for the judge. Because that is the biggest reason to vote. Outside of any other debate that you're going to be having. Gucci. Everyone's Gucci. Okay. Um, that covers most neg things. So I kind of want to move on to... Um, First, let's do if you're going for set call on the app. So you have to take, um, like into the app, any other topic, you're going to be doing research on the topic first to see where the literature leads you, uh, what's popular when you Google things like natural service and compulsory. Um, then, if you do find a lead into any K, really, um, but specifically this one, so like the liquid power one, very easy to find a lead on um, colonial literature because of the um, enforced dumping of nuclear waste on reservation land, the uranium mining that happens on reservation land, and the testing of nuclear weapons that happens on reservation land, you really have to understand why that happens in the first place, because native bodies and native land is used as disposable. Um, that's the lead that I got for that topic. Then, going into that, I don't like to take the soft left approach. It was just not my type of debate. I think it's more fun to kind of take the hard left approach. So um, I'm going to keep on using the nuclear power topic as an example because I think it's just very indicative of what you should be doing in these debates. So let me just actually pull up the app. That's a lot easier. Wait, Dropbox. Um, where are we? Topics. 16 nuclear power app. Okay, here it is. Um, so the way I approached and my team approached this topic was first we outlined the ways in which we outlined the uh, because this the framework for the app is the grande for evidence. It is looking at things through a red pedagogical lens. First thing we did was tell the judge exactly how the resolution is flawed in the ways that we think. So it's like the resolution demands that we discuss nuclear power through the lens of the liberal humanist discourse of the settler colonial state that will always undermine the interest and the demands of the natives for land. This just means the resolution demands we use the state. That ignores all the history of oppression that has suffered, that people have suffered because of set coal. Um, we constantly see the use of rhetoric and discussions of nuclear power framed around protecting the settler and to keep them from feeling guilty. This discussion would merely manifest and resent the colonizer and the colonized systems of exploitation that reproduces because of the grand structures of settler colonialism. The first approach I take to topics when I'm not going to have a soft left act is explaining explicitly my reason for it. So this, I'm like, the topic is inherently colonialist. Nuclear power rhetoric always settlers around, keeping the settler here, protecting the settler. When people talk about nuclear power, it's like, that leads to nuclear war. That means everyone dies. The problem with extinction and big impacts like that, the only reason people care about it, the only reason the settler or white people care about it is because it's the only thing that affects them. They don't feel the effects of the everyday nuclear struggle that um, native populations are already suffering. Um, oh, I just gave you another tip. The reason why big impacts suck in context of this debate? It's the only reason privileged people care, because it's the only thing that affects them. The people who are oppressed and like feel the effects of stuff every day don't care about that because their daily lived experiences are already to the aisle effect. Um, and the um, context itself, the way I approached it was as a demand from an indigenous perspective, because like I personally identify with where my family comes from. Like, not even three generations ago, without a lot of people in northern Mexico, like my great grandmother's was tribal, like still tribal domestically. So it's something I can very closely identify with. So the context I had for the nuclear power topic was thus we demand, and the reason I said we was not like why people, like you know, people are like saying we and our, like their policy team, even though it's just one person. That's just weird to me to say I. The reason I said we was because I spoke in line. This was at the time of Dapple. I spoke in line with other indigenous resistance movements um, across the country and across the world because this is a call for resistance against uh, colonial power structures such as nuclear power. 
So the plan that's ahead was thus we demand that the production of nuclear power ought to be prohibited. B1AC is a form of indigenous activism and resistance that is key to break down the discursive structures that maintain global settler colonialism. I took the approach as me being the activist and me being the form of resistance, and the card I have after that um, was an, an author that wrote specifically about nuclear power and settler colonialism, outlining the ways in which activism is uniquely key to breaking down the structures of colonialism. So it's just one way you can approach, um, I don't want to say non-topical, because it's tangentially topical, but kind of non-topical ways to the topic. Um, more rhetorical-based affirmatives. Um, yeah, actually, I think every affirmative is probably not topical, it's probably rhetoric-based. It is more about the words that we speak than the ideas that, ex that we exchange. So um, I'm really trying to think about this topic but like, I don't know if there's like half ground for this on set coal. I think the half is just like really colonialist. Like, I don't know if there's an approach to it outside of that. Unless you want to go actually not topical and be like, heck to the topic, let's talk about this instead, which I never recommend because that's a lot of tea debate. I mean, you can do it if you want. I'm just not that good at tea. So that was never something I wanted to play around with. Um, yeah. Now, um, moving to ask answers to set goal. Because I truly believe to truly understand an argument, you have to know how to read it and to answer it perfectly. That's the only way you know, that's the only way you can know that you know the topic like the back of your hand. So um, at the bottom of the big file, I put blocks and I also put ask answers. Um, so perm debate. First things first, always make a perm. How are you approaching the perm debate? Um, what's a per, uh, let's say I read, you read like a policy app that's like, oh, like we need U.S. hedge to, you know, help people in the world, military is good. You read a neg that's like, that's colonialist, that's bad, all these bad things have happened, let's reject it. Um, or I guess the neg reads that. As the app, what is the permutation you're going to make? Someone give me a permutation text. Come on, debaters, this should be easy. Perm debates. Uh, perm to both. Okay. So I want to explain that permutation, what the world the permutation would look like. Um, maybe do the ask with the lens of the right kind of Okay. It's kind of like a nice way to look at it. Um, when you make permutations, it's always nice to have a text. Because you just say perm to both, that's not like, I don't think it's an argument. I think one-liners aren't arguments. You have to explain the permutation, how exactly it would function, because the permutation is just another world in the debate that the judge that you're advocating for, that the judge is going to look at. So um, a permutation for a policy app versus um, a neg app is like um, perm do both. We can um, increase military power to have I guess like advantage of the app, um, but also look towards like indigenous groups and stuff. It's a bad perm, um, which is why you should always win the next debate against policy apps, but it's a perm, right? Um, well, with the permutation debate, you always want to prove why the alt alone doesn't solve for the app, because um, more basic knowledge, the alternative of critique should be able to solve not only the critique itself, but the affirmative. So as a negative, you have the burden of proving why the alt solves for the app. Usually that's just like, we get rid of colonialism. That'll solve all the impacts of the app, but you, ha you have that burden. Because why vote neg if you can't even solve what the app's talking about, right? Um, kind of based knowledge of all of it. Um, as the perm, you have to, one, prove why the alt alone can't solve. So if the alternative is just like, let's refuse colonialism, you could be like, what does that do? You refuse colonialism, what does that do? It doesn't really do anything. Rather, if we implement this policy, at least some people will benefit. And um, after we implement the policy, then we can start looking at um, why colonialism is bad kind of thing. It's more like prioritizing the lives that are suffering now, even though the night talks about it too. But from the app, it's like, I'm telling you the ways that all the people are dying because there's war and ISIS and stuff. You're saying let's re reject colonialism. Why don't we save people first and then reject colonialism kind of stuff. Um, that's one way the perm can work. Um, another way you can approach this debate from the affirmative aspect is saying state good. You could, um, you're not going to say American exceptionalism. 
because that's I don't think that has a good connotation to it. You're gonna be like, the state's gonna do it good this time. Like there has been reasons past, and people are gonna be like, look at everything good the state has done. Like, um, legalizing, e e making slavery illegal. I don't know. I think I'm too lost in the sauce to like really think about this in a non-biased perspective. <laughs> um, so you want to have the state good to be, where um, the state's probably good, which like realistically probably is. Um, I hate to say that, but like we have everything we have because of the state. Also, we don't have the state. Like, what does the world look like then? Probably a little chaotic. I don't know. I think we've been too infiltrated by the system to really be able to exist outside of it. Um, so you just kind of go the realistic route, realism. Um, look at policy now. The reason that a lot of good laws are passed, like um, SCOTUS, making gay marriage legal, or like um, legalizing abortion is probably good because like people need abortions, or like, um, I don't know, probably, I mean like ending slavery was good. If it didn't manifest itself in different ways, that'd be better. Like the topic analysis, they talked about on the app. You can talk about when people like forced into like these quote unquote other countries, and they see that then they become like the minority groups, and they see what it's like um, for the colonies, and then they it's like a reflection kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think that it's important. Like it's more personally, like it's important for you to understand. Not you can't never under you can never understand what the other side feels like, but you sort of see what it looks like. Um, my problem is with, like the Peace Corps and stuff that a lot of people are like, oh my god, I'm the savior. Like, look at what the good I'm doing in the world. Because, like, you're doing some good things, um, but, like, don't ever take that approach to it. Like, you're not the white savior. Like, you're doing little things here and there, but don't take that savior complex, which is the reason we kind of got to where we are today. I think that is good app ground, though, because there's the whole argument on the app about community building and, like, um, raising the morale of the country and blah, blah, blah. And if we we're self-reflective about our privilege, then maybe we stop doing bad things, which I think is an argument you go for the app, um, which is an reason why, like, if you have an app like that, a permutation would work well, because we're self-reflective of the ways in which we interact with others that aren't as privileged as we are, maybe we stop doing a lot of bad things. That is certainly a permutation argument to be made, which I think is more reasonable than, like, a straight-up just, like, go to war first. Um, so state good, bad debate is something you're gonna have every round if you're reading any position like this. You just have to be ready for it. Like you have to be able, you have to be able to like extend a good, bad, state good, state bad debate like off the top of your head because it's just something you're gonna have every single round. Like I think I had it every single round this year except for like three. Um, yeah, gotta get used to it. Um, the other one I put in there is like a really bad argument. Um, I put in there more so you hear the argument and you're like this is really stupid but it's like speak who's heard of speaking for others does anyone want to tell me what speaking for others is blurt it out i don't care what about you yeah you yeah it's just a criticism of speaking for others because you i mean there is several things that's like uh modifying your opinion Yeah, it's just like you can't speak for other suffering because one, you don't understand it, so you're already taking that detachment from it. You're kind of like using other suffering to like win the ballot, which like a context debate is kind of true. You're kind of talking about suffering if you're taking a key route. Well, in general, you're talking about suffering to win a ballot, but like outside of that, this argument's kind of stupid because like if you don't talk about issues, how are we ever gonna? know about them in the first place, or like know how to approach them. It's like, I personally think speaking for this argument is stupid, because like, at least you're talking about it, you know? There's certainly a way to do it. You don't want to go up there, you're like, I don't know, why, and you're like, we as a black body, like that, then I think that's when that argument's applicable, that's just, it's just stupid. Um, but for the most part, it's kind of a stupid argument, I put it more in there so you understand why it's stupid and how to answer it, because you know how to answer it, because like, if you just don't answer it, and you're like, oh, well, that's stupid, you're gonna lose that debate. That, that, saying something stupid is not an argument. Fun fact.
or not the hard way. Um, and then there's um, an essentialization to set the critique, which I also put in here, which I think can be fairly reasonable sometimes, depending on the way people approach the negative. Um, saying indigenous populations, kind of hard to like label the experiences of native people as being whole or one, because there are just so many different types and cultures. There's so many different cultures within what we consider native people um, that we can't really talk about all their experiences in one. We just can't. Like the experience of every person is different. The experience of every um, culture is different. So the centralization to that is just like criticizing the ways in which we speak about the native population. So being like, native people are feeling this right now. Like that's sort of a centralizing experience, you know? Like you can't be like, all great people feel this way, all women feel this way, like, can't really do that. But an answer to that would be like, it's not that we're saying like they all feel this one way, we're just kind of being like, yo, there's been a lot of suffering for like Native people. If that does risk essentialization, I think that form of essentialization is probably good because we're recognizing um, the bad things that came out of colonialism that a bunch of people had to experience. Like, I can't even quantify how many people had to experience, and still are experiencing. Um, yeah, those are like the basic ways in which you can kind of answer that call outside of like normal no link, impact turn, alt fails kind of debate, which everyone understands because I don't have a basic understanding how to answer case. Anyone want me to go over that real quick? No? Kind of. It's fine if you raise your hand. Yeah. Um, thank you for sitting through two hours of me speaking. Um, yeah, um, for those of you who had Dropbox trouble, let me just stop this stupid.